Realism and Realism by H.P. Lovecraft Concerning the quality of mastery and of poise in trying situations, I believe that it arises more from hereditary than environmental considerations. Its possession cannot be acquired through the culture of the individual, although the systematic culture of a certain class during many generations undoubtedly tends to bring out such strength to a degree which will cause that class to produce a higher average of dominant individuals than an uncultivated class of equal numerical magnitude. I doubt whether it would be possible to create any class strong enough to sway permanently a vast body of inferiors. Hence, I perceive the impracticability of Nietzscheism and the essential instability of even the strongest governments. There is no such thing, and there never will be such a thing as good and permanent government among the crawling, miserable vermin called human beings. Aristocracy and monarchy are the most efficient in developing the best qualities of mankind as expressed in achievements of taste and intellect, but they lead to an unlimited arrogance. That arrogance, in turn, leads inevitably to their decline and overthrow. On the other hand, democracy and autocracy lead just as certainly to decline and collapse through their lack of any stimulus to individual achievement. They may perhaps last longer, but that is because they are closer to the primal animal or savage state from which civilized man is supposed to have partly evolved. Communism is a characteristic of many savage tribes, whilst absolute anarchy is the rule amongst the majority of wild animals. The brain of the white human animal has advanced to such a state that the colorless equality of the lower animals is painful and unendurable to it. It demands an individual struggle for complex conditions and sensations which can only be achieved by a few at the expense of the many. This demand will always exist, and it will never be satisfied, because it divides mankind into hostile groups, constantly struggling for supremacy, and successively gaining and losing it. When there is an autocracy, we may be sure that the masses will someday overthrow it. And when there is a democracy or a clocracy, we may be sure that some group of mentally and physically superior individuals will someday overthrow it by establishing a more or less enduring but never wholly permanent supremacy, either through judgment in playing men against each other, or through patience and ability in concentrating power by taking advantage of the indolence of the majority. In a word, the social organization of humanity is in a state of perpetually and incurably unstable equilibrium. The very notion of such things as perfection, justice, and improvement is an illusion based on vain hopes and overdrawn analogies. It must be remembered that there is no real reason to expect anything in particular from mankind. Good and evil are local expedients, or their lack, and not in any sense cosmic truth or laws. 
we call a thing good because it promotes certain petty human conditions that we happen to like, whereas it is just as sensible to assume that all humanity is a noxious pest which should be eradicated like rats or gnats for the good of the planet or of the universe. There are no absolute values in the whole blind tragedy of mechanistic nature. Nothing is either good or bad, except as judged from an absurdly limited point of view. The only cosmic reality is mindless, undeviating fate, automatic, unmoral, uncalculating inevitability. As human beings, our only sensible scale of values is one based on the lessening of the agony of existence. That plan is most deserving of praise, which most ably fosters the creation of the objects and conditions best adapted to diminish the pain of living for those most sensitive to its depressing ravages. To expect perfect adjustment in happiness is absurdly unscientific and unphilosophical. We can only seek a more or less trivial mitigation of suffering. I believe in an aristocracy because I deem it the only agency for the creation of those refinements which make life endurable for the human animal of high organization. Since the only human motive is a craving for supremacy, we can expect nothing in the way of achievement unless achievement be rewarded by supremacy. We cannot expect justice. Justice is a mocking phantom, and we know that aristocracy has many undesirable features. But we also know, sadly enough, that we can never abolish the evils without abolishing everything of value to civilized man. In an aristocracy, some persons have a great deal to live for. In a democracy, most persons have a little to live for. In an ochlocracy, nobody has anything whatever to live for. Aristocracy alone is capable of creating thoughts and objects of value. Everyone, I fancy, will admit that such a state must precede democracy or ochlocracy in order to build the original culture. Fewer are willing to admit the cognate truth that democracies and ochlocracies merely subsist parasitically on the aristocracies they overthrow, gradually using up the aesthetic and intellectual resources which autocracy bequeathed them and which they never could have created for themselves. The rate of squandering depends upon the completeness of the departure from aristocracy. Where the old spirit lingers, the process of deterioration may be very slow indeed. Certain belated additions compensating for the decline. But where the rabble gain full sway taste is certain to vanish, and dullness reigns darkly triumphant over the ruins of culture. Wealth and luxury are essential alike to the creation and the full appreciation of beauty and truth. Indeed, it is the existence of wealth and luxury and of the standards which they establish that gives most of the pleasure felt by the non-wealthy and non-luxurious. The masses would rob themselves by cutting off the real source of of that slight enjoyment which they secure, as it were, by reflection.
When, however, I praise autocracy, I do not by any means refer to such absolute monarchies as Tsaristic Russia or Kaiseristic Germany. Moderation is essential in all things, and overstressed political autocracy produces an infinity of stupid checks on art and intellect. A tolerable amount of political liberty is absolutely essential to the free development of the mind, so that, in speaking of the virtues of an aristocratic system, the philosopher has in view less a governmental despotism than an arrangement of well-defined traditional social classes, like those of England and France. Governmental aristocracy need go no further than to safeguard an aristocratic class in its opulence and dignity, so that it may be left free to create the ornaments of life and to attract the ambition of others who seek to rise to it. The healthiest aristocracy is the most elastic, willing to beckon and receive, as accessions, all men of whatever antecedents, who prove themselves aesthetically and intellectually fitted for membership. It gains, moreover, if its members can possess that natural nobility which is content with a recognition of its own worth, and which demonstrates its superiority in superior works and behavior, rather than in snobbish and arrogant speech and attitude. The real aristocrat is ever reasonable kindly and affable toward the masses. It is the incompletely cultured Noxus Homo who makes ostentation of his power, and since all are but the blind result of uncomposition. Yet, in the last analysis, it is futile to pass judgment upon any type of social order, trollable fate, and utterly beyond the power of any statesman or reformer to alter or amend. All human life is weary, incomplete, unsatisfying, and sardonically purposeless. It has always been, and always will be, so that he who looks for a paradise is merely a dupe of myths, or of his own imagination. The will and emotion of man crave conditions that do not and never will exist, so that the wise man is he who kills will and emotion to a degree enabling him to despise life and sneer at its puerile illusions and unsubstantial goals. The wise man is a laughing cynic. He takes nothing seriously, ridicules earnestness and zeal, and wants nothing because he knows that the cosmos holds nothing worth wanting. And yet, being wise, he is not a tenth as happy as a dog or peasant that knows no life or aspiration above the simplest animal plane. It is good to be a cynic. It is better to be a contented cat. And it is best not to exist at all. Universal suicide is the most logical thing in the world. We reject it only because of our primitive cowardice and childish fear of the dark. If we were sensible, we would seek death, the same blissful blank which we enjoyed before we existed. It does not matter what happens to the race and the cosmos, the existence or non-existence of the earth and its miserable inhabitants is a thing of the most complete indifference. Arcturus would glow just as cheerfully if the whole solar system were wiped out.
The undesirability of any system of rule not tempered with the quality of kindness is obvious for kindness is a complex collection of various impulses, reactions, and realizations highly necessary to the smooth adjustment of botched and freakish creatures like most human beings. It is a weakness, basically, or, in some cases, an ostentation of secure superiority. But its net effect is desirable. Hence, it is, on the whole, praiseworthy. Since all motives at bottom are selfish and ignoble, we may judge acts and qualities only by their effects. Pessimism produces kindness. The disillusioned philosopher is ever more tolerant than the priggish bourgeois idealist with his sentimental and extravagant notions of human dignity and destiny. The conviction that the world and man is something which had better not have been, says Schopenhauer, is of a kind to fill us with indulgence toward one another. It reminds us of that which is, after all, the most necessary thing in life, the tolerance, patience, and regard, and love of neighbor, of which everyone stands in need, and which, therefore, every man owes his fellow. 1922